Hi, and welcome to Bright Minds from Tickmill. I'm your host, Patrick Munnerly. And in this series, we're setting out to answer some of the most commonly asked questions around investment and trading through entertaining and insightful conversations with seasoned insiders. Millennials, loosely defined as those born between the early 1980s and the late 1990s, now make up the largest generation in the workforce. And as such, their financial habits and aspirations are reshaping the financial landscape. However, this generation has faced numerous economic hurdles that have shaped their financial journeys in profound ways. According to a recent study, 48% of millennials experience anxiety over their finances, the highest figure for any generation older or younger. The 2008 financial crisis, rising student loan debt, huge technological upheaval of the jobs market, and of course the global pandemic have all impacted the millennial financial profile. These factors, combined with the rising cost of living and stagnant wages, have made it challenging for millennials to achieve financial stability, invest for their future, and reach important milestones such as home ownership. But it's not all doom and gloom. Millennials are, on average, more educated than previous generations, and thanks to being the first generation to grow up with computers and the internet, are quick to adopt a new technology which has given rise to new avenues for financial success. Millennials are also reshaping the investment landscape and are credited with driving growth in ESG or sustainable investing. Our guest today, Gabriel Nussenbaum, left a career in the financial industry to pursue his mission to spread financial literacy, providing online content covering money-saving ideas, investment guides and budgeting tips. He's gained over 1.3 million followers on TikTok alone, with over 46 million views on the platform. In today's episode, we'll be discussing millennials' financial habits, social media, side hustle culture, and the role of good financial education. Gabriel, thanks for joining us today. Could you start by giving us an overview of your journey so far and tell us what motivated you to quit your nine to five to build a career as a financial content creator? I graduated uh, from Imperial College studying mechanical engineering and went into a quite typical path, which is finance. Uh, It's probably one of the more common paths of engineers these days, um, despite the protests of our lecturers. And uh, I was there for two years on a graduate scheme at Barclays within the payment sector. And to be honest, I loved it. It was really, really enjoyable. However, at the same time, I was also building uh, my kind of side hustle, as you could call it, which was creating finance-based social media to, as you put it quite nicely, increase financial literacy. And of course, this was predominantly through short form content, which like you said, is TikTok, Instagram Reels, the rest. So it was really bite-sized, 30-second educational videos um, just to, you know, spark someone's interest, give someone something to think about on a platform filled with mainly entertainment and very little education at the time. And I was quite fortunate uh, in the fact that after two to three weeks on the platform, my content was being picked up by a very large audience, um, to my surprise. And within one month, there were a uh, 100,000 people following me. Within six months, there were a million people following me. So quite the rise. Um, I really tried not to think about numbers too much, but I suppose that's a conversation <laughs> for another time. And yeah, so I was I was doing this for quite a long time. And after about a year, of creating content and starting to build a revenue source through it via brand deals and other means and sources, um, I realized that this essentially could be done full time. I loved what I was doing. I was really interested and passionate on the topic. And about, what were we now, eight months, eight to nine months ago, last summer, I decided to tell Barclays that I was going to leave and pursue this full time. And to be honest, the people around me were ecstatic. They were really happy for me. And it's been quite the the journey ever since trying to A, figure out how to be self-employed, being that, you know, until that point, I've gone through school, university, and then a full nine to five job. So this is a, a very new experience for me, um, but also just incredible in terms of some of the experiences and opportunities that I've had. For example, talking on podcasts like these, which I, is still a little bit surreal to me. And I'm very fortunate for all of those opportunities. Um We heard in the introduction some of the factors that have affected the finances of the typical millennial, Um, for example, student loan debt, 
rising cost of living and the pandemic, I guess to name a few. What have been your personal experiences of these factors and how have you managed their impact on your finances? Obviously, like most Gen Z and millennials, probably starting to earn a salary for the first time, uh, we've been hit by some of the hardest times possible (laughs) coming out of university. I mean, I graduated during COVID, um, started work during COVID completely online. And now I've had to go through what you could probably look back and call another financial crisis here in the UK. Um, So in terms of looking at things like student loans, these are constant debates as to do you want to pay things off more aggressively or are you happy to just keep looking at it as, I suppose, a tax burden rather than a loan burden, which is one way that people look at it. Um, In terms of trying to just keep up and live in London, obviously coming out of university, you could argue that you're going into your lowest uh, wage expectancy it should be kind of upwards from there um, but I wanted to move out um, I have moved out I'm living in London obviously soaring food prices 10% inflation on average over the past year or so you could look at all of the th- these things are struggles um, but of course I know at the same time I'm quite fortunate I've been ma- able to, to manage to keep up to pay my bills all these kind of things but um, my objective and I suppose my experience is that this is not the case for the majority of people my age, um, which is why I'm hoping through this financial literacy that I provide in, in terms of social media, I can help someone somewhere in some way. Um, because as it's commonly known here in the UK, especially financial education is pretty much nil. Um, it was not taught to me in school. Um, it was not taught to me in university. Uh, everything that I know is more or less either self-taught or come through, you know, personal Um, relations, family, teaching me things. Um, But that's not the case for most people. Most people don't go and seek out this education on their own. They don't have family that's able to educate them. So I've gone to the places that these people are, and that is social media. And so hopefully I'm sparking interest in one person or a few people to try and, you know, learn their way out of this crisis. And have you found that social media plays a big part in millennials' financial decision making? And and if so, do you think the uh, the impact is broadly positive or negative? From my experience, it is huge, astronomical, the size um, in terms of the expectancy of millennials taking their education from these sources. Um, you have to probably think about, firstly, the amount of time that people are spending on these apps, uh, whether it be social media or even somewhere like YouTube, which I suppose you could look as a bit of a search engine. It's where I predominantly educated myself before looking to more, you know, I suppose, um, well-known resources like books, journals, magazines, newspaper reports, all those kind of things. Um, but it is where I started. And from listening to my audience, it's where a lot of them are starting as well. It's their first interaction with even considering financial education in the first place, um, which is crazy to think about. And like you just mentioned, along with the good comes the bad. There are a lot of people taking advantage, um, especially during the pandemic years. So through 2021 and 2022, when I was having my growth, um, there was a lot of accounts, especially in short form, that were taking advantage of telling people exactly what to do, you know, financial advice, which is quite literally illegal. Um, They were saying, buy this stock, buy this crypto. I mean, you had the crypto surge, which obviously crashed because it was kind of a high and fashionable thing at the time. So there was a lot, a lot of dangerous information and misinformation being put out there for people that were not educated on the subject. And kind of what I set out as my mission at that time was just if I can try and be the balance, be that financial education. So when they are being, you know, when they are seeing this other side of the content, the more harmful side, at least they're going in there with a bit of, you know, educational and financial educational background. What are some of the practical tips for millennials looking to, I guess, establish a a solid financial foundation, including things like budgeting, saving, and and especially in this day and age, managing debt? There are a lot of tips that I'll give, but I'll try and kind of distill it down to a few top ones. So I think the first and one of the most important is just to start talking and educating yourself on the subject. Again, here in the UK, finance, talking about money is a massive taboo. People are not comfortable talking about the subject. I don't know where that's come from specifically. Maybe it's our culture. Maybe it's just generation to generation. But I've always told people, just start talking about it with someone in your circle. Because balancing those conversations and having a, a opening up those conversations 
might save you a lot of money down the line when a crisis hits you, something that you're not sure about. And instead of keeping that inwards and just to yourself and holding on to it and potentially making it more harmful, you're comfortable just saying something to someone who might point you in the right direction, whether that's someone you know or even looking for professional help and advice. So that's one of the biggest tips that I've given people, obviously, on top of that, educating yourself and looking into it on your own. Um, And then the second thing is... For the majority of people, cutting out, you know, a Starbucks here or there isn't going to be that thing that's going to save you financially. Uh, I've always spoken about the three big categories, which are transport, housing and um, food. Those are your three bigger spend categories for the majority of people my age. So if you are looking to try and significantly save money, attack those categories. Can you, you know, rent somewhere 10% cheaper? Because let's say you and a partner are paying, I don't know, 1,500 to 2,000 pounds a month. 150 pounds a month saved is a massive amount of money compared to three pounds a week on your Starbucks. So those are the places that you really need to look. And then the third thing that I say is just start being aware of your outgoings because everyone is fully aware of how much money is going into their account. If you're being paid, you're fully aware what your salary is, how much you're getting after tax, you're keeping an eye on that and you see that nice number come into your account. What people really don't keep track of is what's leaving their account. They don't keep an eye, they have no idea. If you ask the average person, how much did you spend last month? They'll say, I have absolutely no idea. So what I found in my own personal experience is by literally becoming comfortable with opening up your bank account and starting to look once a month at how much has gone out, you will easily start to find things that are not necessary where you can cut expenditure really quickly. And I think that's kind of what it is at the moment. It's all about saving, you know, money where you can because that's really, really important to hold on whilst we're going through this turbulent stage to save anything you can for a more successful future, but also to go towards those things that are soaring in costs like your food, like your, you know, energy bills, all those kind of things. So those are three really big tips I'd give to people my age. According to a recent bank rate survey, around half of millennial Americans have an additional source of income outside their main method of earning. Uh, What opportunities and challenges do side hustles present and how can millennials effectively manage their finances while pursuing these ventures? I think side hustles are brilliant, but I don't think they have to be for everyone. Obviously, I'm coming from someone who had a side hustle and built it out quite successfully. But I can understand why some people, you know, just want to get on with their nine to five. They want to just work and relax, work and relax. And there's just two different ways of looking and approaching, you know, your working life. And maybe it will just come at a different time. So if those of you that or for those people listening that are encouraged or do like the idea of a side hustle, I think it's a fantastic opportunity. One thing that's become quite noticeable, especially during the pandemic again and post pandemic is the idea that there's really no such thing as a stable job anymore. You saw people with lifelong commitments to companies being let go because companies all of a sudden had to cut costs. They were being absolutely, you know, devastated by by a crisis. And regardless of how loyal you'd been, how long you'd been there, how much experience you had, if they did not need you anymore, it was like bye-bye. So the idea of a side hustle maybe might sound a little bit, you know, relaxed. Another way that you could probably consider it is just an additional source of income something that can stabilize you if the worst thing happens. So let's say you lose your job, but if you've built that second source of income, that third source of income, losing a job isn't going to be, you know, like life-threatening to you. You don't have to, you know, really desperately try and get a job ASAP because you've got other sources of income um, being brought in, which is an attractive thing. And I do think that most people should should start to to look at those sources. And in terms of, you know, like you mentioned, managing your finances whilst also looking for a side hustle, I understand that these things are difficult, but I suppose one way to approach it is when building another source of income, it doesn't have to start tomorrow. You don't have to be bringing something in like literally within 24 hours. What I've done here and through my side hustle took 12 months to put it to a place where it was bringing in a nice um, part of revenue. But that's probably even quite a quick time span. I mean, think about how long it took you to get your job through 15 years of education plus another four years or three years in higher education to get to where you are. You weren't in a rush to get the job that time round. So think about it that way and really plan it a, a long-term option uh, that you're going to enjoy and be passionate about because that's part of the, you know, a big part of building side hustles. And what uh, what role does financial education play in empowering millennials to make 
uh, informed financial decisions. I think financial education is everything, but I don't want it to sound intimidating at the same time. So often what I tell people is, if you can, you know, put in a bit of effort, I don't know, a few hours, you will probably put yourself in a position ahead of 90% of the country. You will understand, you know, the basics, the fundamentals of budgeting, the fundamentals of how tax and debt work, the fundamentals of investment, you know, all of these categories that aren't complicated to t get from level zero to level one. No one's telling anyone that they need to get to level 10, because if you're not interested in it, the don't, don't even bother because you're just going to be put off by it more. Get yourself to level one and you're going to be in a really, you know, good standing position. And that's what I see as kind of the, the paramount and the, the importance of financial literacy. How can we improve financial literacy amongst this generation? That's the, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? That's the one I'm trying to solve on my own. I mean, I would love some kind of formalized education in, you know, in especially in the UK, but but worldwide. I mean, it's so important. I mean, we, a lot of people say they don't work for money or money isn't everything. And, you know, there's so much more to life. But it is like undeniable the importance of money in your life. Uh, just having it to, you know, pay the bare necessities or having it to give yourself options uh, to further enhance uh, the experiences that you have within your life. So regardless of whether, you know, you're driven by money or not, it will interact with your life, which is why I think that every single person needs some kind of formalized education on the matter. Um, but until that point, I will continue doing my bit to try and use, you know, unrecognized sources, social media, YouTube, speaking to people as and when I can out in public or in person or with my family. Uh, because until something formal is put in, these are the sources that most people are going to go and learn from. What do you think are some of the investment strategies that are suitable for millennials at the different stages of their lives? And, and how can they get started, get a, get a foot on the ladder, so to speak? So obviously, with everything, I have to say that this isn't financial advice. I'll, I'll kind of share my own personal experiences with, you know, starting uh, your relationship with investing. The first thing I always tell people is just education. It does not take long. Go on YouTube and watch a half an hour video explaining the concept of investing and how it works. And then a second one showing you how to do it, a bit of a tutorial. Um, and often what I tell people is they're like, which platform, um, which, you know, ETF should I invest into? Or like, should it be the S&P, the US market or the UK market? And I like to just say, do your education to figure out your own answers, but just start because starting is probably the biggest hurdle that most people have to, you know, attempt. And I'm not telling people again that they need to be putting away, you know, a thousand pounds a month or 250 pounds a month, but just start putting away, you know, a pound, throw something in there that will just get some skin in the game to, to make you want to learn about it more. Uh, because I think it's a fundamental tool that is just not used. I think, what did I see as a stat the other day? 14% of people in the UK have um, an ISA, which is like, you know, a stocks and shares ISA, which which is, you know, our, our tax protected investing account option here in the UK. It's called other things around the world, you know, your, your Roth IRA, all those kind of things in the US. But that's a really no, low number. I don't know. I mean, I might have had that stat wrong. I think it's the, maybe that at an upper limit. So just getting that skin in the game and starting to, you know, attempt it. Often when I'm talking to people in the street, they just say they can't afford to invest. Obviously, their money's going elsewhere. And I completely understand that side of things as well. But if that is the case for yourself, then perhaps put yourself in the position where you know about what investing is and the benefits of it, of what it is, so that when you are in the position to go and start putting some money away, there's not any more hesitation. Uh, because a lot of what is kind of common research in the investing game is that time in the market always beats timing the market. You want to try and start early um, or as early as you can. So once you can, you know, take that leap. Always, I, I would always say try and do it if, if that's right in your personal situation. And I guess, um, so looking ahead, what do you think will be the most significant financial challenges and I guess opportunities as well for millennials in the coming years? And how can they prepare for them? By far the biggest challenge that I'm experiencing, and I'm seeing other people around me experience is the housing market. I mean, 
what is it now? 10 times the average salary uh, to try and buy a property, give or take, you know, <laughs> a factor. Maybe that's 11 or nine, who knows? It, it just seems to be so difficult. And I'm one of those people personally struggling. I rent at the moment, um, but I would love the opportunity to buy. And I just think that that is probably the biggest kind of crisis for this generation. Obviously, you hear all the generations talk about, oh, when we were buying a house, it was 15% mortgage rate. Um, but you know, you take it very easy to take a look back then and see that, yeah, but house prices were three times your salary, not <laughs> 10 times your salary. <laughs> so, so there's obviously that argument. And I think that it's, it's going to be very tough. There's no other way to put, to, to kind of say it. You've got companies that are trying to come out with new mortgage, um, you know, um, offerings like an hundred percent offering that came out last month. We've been down that route before and it didn't work too well. <laughs> I was going to say, if you throw us back, what, 15 years ago to 120%, 125%, I do think it's different these days. I think they're done with a lot more stringency. They're a lot more strict about who can get these pro um, products. And I don't think we're going down the same route as, you know, what happened yeah. 15 years ago. Um, but I think it's also very important to tell uh, the current generation that buying a property isn't the be all and end all anymore. It was often fantasized as, you know, like, the American dream or the British dream to own your own property. Um, but I'm very comfortable with renting, to be honest. Uh, I've got no liabilities. If something goes wrong with my property, that's down to my landlord. Uh, it's quite a reasonable rate compared to potentially what I'd be paying for a mortgage right now with the current interest sure. rates. And, you know, I've got flexibility. If I want to move somewhere else in a year or two, I'm not so stressed because, you know, my contract finishes and I can go sure. and do that. Um, so I think renting is is quite a superpower these days and it really needs to be taken more advantage of and seen as a quite a positive option for the current generation with the current struggles of what's going on with trying to buy a house. Gabriel, thank you so much for uh, for joining us today. Um, where can our listeners find you online? So I am pretty much on every social media platform. So whichever one you like to consume your social media on, whether it be YouTube TikTok, Instagram, or even Snapchat. I know there are some very young listeners, if there are, that might still be on that platform, just through my name. So if you look up Gabriel Nesbam, you should be able to find me. And I hope that you enjoy the content that I put out into the world. Great stuff. Thanks again for your time, Gabriel. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me.